I'm just observing Zach's father. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Zach's father. <laughs> Zach's father. Has My name is Sam Wise, uh, Roger's son. Son of Hogan, right? <laughs> I'm a uh, father combo. Ornament. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a great dashboard companion. <laughs>
Seamus Haney, of course, as we know as a poet, he's kind of admitting to his own lack of credentials, I guess, in the, in the field of agriculture, and so he's saying that, uh, you know, he's a poet, he's got his, got his pen snug as a gun, and it's the same as he's kind of uh, comparing it to his father digging. And I think the poem is really fantastic for its ability to collaborate language in a way that uh, says exactly what's being, you know, expresses what is being said as well as says it directly in the language itself. So that's a really strong thing, I would think, for poetry. And it works well for prose as well. Uh, prose, I think, is a lot more, um, you know, because you're, you're working, sometimes with poetry you're not working with a full sentence or a full deck. <laughs> um, so you're, you're, you know, you're wanting to be spontaneous, you're wanting to be um, creative and, and kind of illuminate some, some factor. And a lot of times you, when you're writing, you don't even know what you're going to write. You know, you just write um, something that is a poem. Um, I've read a lot of poets who say it's an art of discovery. Um, you start writing, you, you know, you don't know where you're going to go. And I think that's important. You know, you may come up with a spark. You may, your mind may just say, shoot a line at you, and you think, well, that sounds interesting. You write. And don't stop there. Just keep, just keep going. You know, just uh, sometimes just jotting down um, whatever pops in your head and and um, you know how you arrange things. And sometimes the language just works itself. It works itself out. You, you know, I just read an interesting article by George Saunders. I think it was in the Guardian, where he discusses his book uh, that came out a couple of years back. And he uh, he talks about you know on your forehead there's a kind of a plus and minus. And you know as you're writing and you're making the characters. Uh, sort of interact and do their actions and do what they do, and you, you know, have a scenario in your head. And uh, I think that, that uh, what he's saying is, you know, you have the plus and minus, you know, does this work? Uh, maybe not, so just the minus. Well, maybe I'll tweak it a little bit, maybe I'll go a little further to the plus. And so you kind of, you trust your instincts, really, uh, when you're writing. Um, it's very important to develop those instincts, and that's what practice is for, you know. So that's, it's a lot of fun, you know, just relax and enjoy it, you know. It just, it's, um, wonderful thing, and I, a little history on Transcendent Zero Press, um, I started it in about 2010 with Harbinger Asylum, and it was just a bunch of papers, I think Debbie may remember, do you remember when we just had it, it was just paper folded and stapled, yeah. Yeah, you, I, I still have a couple of copies of those in my house, um, but we just went to a print shop, and I thought it was great, because we were helping a local printing business, and uh, pay a couple hundred bucks, and just have them staple it, and there we go. Uh, and I would collect poetry from people on the internet, and uh, we gradually developed into where we were at the Poets Writers Database, um, and uh, which is a good database if you're interested in publishing, actually publishing your poetry, going to that extent. Poets and Writers Database is a very good resource for um, collecting, you know, presses that are publishing. Uh, you might even consider getting a subscription to their magazine, which is not terribly expensive. It's, I think it's like $13 for a year, it's four issues, comes out every two months. Uh, and, uh, you know, we actually have a, a good solid base in Houston as far as uh, the Poets and Writers. There's a friend of mine, a friend of Zach's as well, uh, named Lupe Mendez, who is now doing, coordinating uh, a lot of the Poets and Writers activity in the Houston area. And they do things like grants for workshops and readings, and so that's really good. Um, to bring literary activity. I've actually had a couple of grants. We've, we've been granted a couple of times for readings in the Houston area. Uh, we had Nusha Akella, which I have her book. I have to have three copies of her book, uh, Rosary of Latitudes. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just, that's a really good resource, poets and writers, and the, the website is pw.org. And uh, there's plenty of databases. Um, there's also new pages, which I don't know the web address right offhand. Um, but New Pages is, uh, is a good resource for all kinds of literary journals and, um, you know, poetry, fiction, whatever you're doing. There's something out there that'll, that'll you know, work for you, I'm sure. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very fun process. And I, you know, it's, it's also a very difficult process because you're going to get turned down and turned down and turned down repeatedly. I have, you know, <laughs> I don't know anybody that hasn't. Um, and there's actually a, a sort of unstated rule that somebody came up with that you want to try to collect 100 rejections a year. That's an interesting rule. You want to collect rejections. Well, what it does is it turns the rejection into a badge of honor. You're like, okay, I got my first rejection. Now I'm a second, third. And you keep going, you know, and it keeps, it keeps you going. It's a nice little, you know, trick to sort of reverse psychology, you know. It keeps you 
occupied and submitting and so forth. So that's uh, it's very fun. It's actually a fun process, and I've heard people compare it to kind of like a gambling thing. You know, you just throw your poem out there, you don't know who's going to take it or who's going to like it or who's not. It's sort of a crapshoot, basically. So, or, you know, if you have a story, as you said, you write horror fiction. I just released a book of a sort of a, it's a novella, it's um, horror fiction, basically, the crime thriller. Yeah, there, there is, she's got it. Yeah, that's it right there. Published by Alien Buddha. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, be not afraid of what you may find. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. I wrote it a couple of years back and finally found a publisher for it. Submitted it to two other publishers who rejected me. And then I gave up on it, and then I submitted it again, and the guy took it. So that's the process. I got lucky with the third chance, you know, I just happened to hit a guy that was interested. So, But uh, I won the, uh, or I didn't win, quote unquote. I, I placed as a finalist in the Adelaide um, Short Fiction Contest when they first held one. Uh, they're based in the Bronx, uh, in New York. And uh, it's a really good literary journal, Adelaide Literary Journal, and they do. Uh, regular publications. We have a held contest. I think it's like $20 or $25 to enter. And I just thought, why not? Why not give it a shot? I entered $25. I'm mostly poetry. I do poetry, and I wrote a short story that I thought, why not throw it out there? And they took it. So they took it placed as a finalist. Uh, didn't win, exactly, but uh, got up on the short list. So that was pretty cool. And uh, we, me and Zach, you know, with Harbinger Asylum, we got a um, National Poetry Awards. Uh, we ended up uh, play, being the runner-up in, in their uh, thing. They they do a sort of a election process where they select the journals that they think are most promising or whatever, and then, you know, people nominate these journals, and then they go through a process where they figure out which four are going to be on the list, and then we made the list and we placed second, and that was pretty promising for us. That was in 2013, I believe. Yeah, when I went out there and it was uh, it was a nice uh, nice uh, situation in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, um, and let's see what else. Uh, you know, did, did you do a word around town tour? He did word around town tour. That was fun. I don't think they're doing that anymore. But nope. yeah, that one that one that was Lupe actually was running that before he became involved with poets and writers. So that, you know, you just never know where it's going to go. I, I when I started the literary journey, I had no clue what I was doing. I mean, literally, it just it's like jump in the water and swim. And I started off by just mostly local poets, people that I knew, people off the internet who sounded like they had interesting things to say. And uh, after about two or three years, I met Zach, and I gave him a copy of the journal, and he was like, well, this is really cool. And so I was like, hey, you seem pretty dedicated. You're you know, interested in what you're doing here. And, and uh, I said, well, why don't, you, why don't you join us? And we started Transcend Zero Press and went to full collections. and. Uh, full books. We started with Marcy's and Ken Jones uh, in 2013, and we did a series. You know, you also have to do a lot of events when you're writing. If you know you're gonna make any money, you have to do events, and it's just part of it because uh, you have to sell your books, and that's a major factor is being hands-on. You know, it's really hard to sell online. I can say that from experience. Um, my books. You know, it's hard for me to sell my books online. It's hard for anybody. I know a lot of people sell two or three copies of their books, and then that, they're proud of that. I mean, that's that's good. Um, just a couple props. And it's uh, it's just really, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I never expected to go anywhere with it. I just it was something I loved to do, and that's what I did. And you know, we've got all these books here that we've published, and I'll show you guys what we did with. Uh, this is a children's children's book children's story, and it's a translation from uh, the Republic of Georgia, uh, and Lynn Coffin, she actually, I, I'm, I connected with her through email, and I've met her, and so is Zach, and uh, we we met her, she came down here and did a reading series for her, her uh, selected poetry, that was one of the ones we actually got a uh, grant for, and she, um, one of her translations I think he's a Polish poet. Um, he he actually won the Nobel Prize, and they used her translation for awarding the Nobel Prize to this poet. I can't remember his name, but uh, if you look up Lynn Coffin on Wikipedia, they'll have the, the person's name on there. Um, she has a whole list of. She's been published with. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name. I think it was the best short stories of one year. 
Joyce Carol Oates was the uh, editor, and she was in that. She's been published in, uh, I want to say the Christian Science Monitor published something of hers, too. I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, this is this is the book that we published, Children's, it's a children's Story. It's a really pleasant story, you know, um, very beautiful, and um, we loved uh, putting that together. And it also has some illustrations from an artist in the Republic of Georgia. So we did that, and it's it's... It took a lot of time. I mean, this was months and months and, you know, all kinds of nice stuff in there. And that's one of the things we we do is, uh, you know, we take our time, let things churn themselves out. And I bounce back and forth with the authors and, you know, put the thing together and send it to them and they make any corrections they want to make. And uh, it's a very time-consuming process, but it's, it's very much heart into it. So it's something that's worth doing, I think, just because you love doing it. If you don't love doing it, don't do it. Don't get involved. <laughs> it's like, you know, jumping into a battlefield, you know. You never know what's going to happen, you know. Uh, you know, if you can't dodge bullets, then don't jump on the battlefield. It's, it's really tough, and it's tough for anybody. It doesn't matter what level of craft you're in. You know, uh, you could be professional, and you're still going to get turned down a lot. They just have a, as they say, success is for those who continue, even in spite of the odds, you know. Uh, so it's very time-consuming, and it can be uh, rewarding when it, when, it, when you do hit something, when you get somewhere with it, it it's very you know, pleasant. It's nice to see your reward pay off, you know, something come to you for what you do. So, um, like I said, you know, I won a couple of awards, and I was actually uh, feature, a feature for Public Poetry in 2013, which is a local series that the Houston Press nominated them or voted them as the best reading, reading series in Houston. Uh, so that was a really nice uh, honor for me to do that. And uh, I was also a, um, a featured poet at AIBF one year, and they did a special reading for us, and uh, it was really nice. We really enjoyed that. Uh, but that was uh, uh, 2013. And so uh, that's, it's just something you want to do because you want to do it. And uh, my phone is talking to me. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, oh, I thought that was Facebook. I hate when that happens. Don't you hate when that happens? It's letting me know that, you know, hey, you're not paying enough attention to me right now. I'm like, well, I know I spend a lot of time on the internet, but hey, you know, I'm busy right now. It's like, you're, it's like your, you know, dog or your best friend or something. Hey, kid, shut up. <laughs> so if Zach wants to uh, approach the mic here and just do his portion, uh, and like I said, we have uh, plenty of uh, books that if you want to look through them and you want to, he also has his books. I have some of mine. Um, I have my book, No Go In. I don't have one copy, unfortunately. Uh, but I do have uh, several copies of my book, Frenetic No Contest, which was a ekphrastic work uh, from a, uh, came out a couple of years years ago. And so I'm promoting those. And I, we have some of our own books. Uh, Lynn, Lynn Lifshin. I've got Lynn Coffin here. And lots of uh, nice little things. You just come and look when you when we get through. So I'll let Zach take the, take the stage. I want to see if it's even pointing up. <laughs> gotcha. All right. I'm just keeping my seat warm. Um, I'm using all my ZMYs. And, uh, yeah, my ZMY. It's, uh, oh, it's my, it's my pen name. Um, so, uh, I, uh, I started off, uh, in 2010, I attended a few of these readings, uh, a couple at Barnes Noble, a couple at this place that used to exist in Seabrook called Coffee Oasis. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, um, and um, I saw this cat here uh, promoting this journal called Harbinger Asylum. Just the name alone just caught me by surprise. And uh, he gave me a, a copy or two of the magazine, and I was just mesmerized. Not only by the diversity of people in there, but just the diversity of styles. I knew I had to become involved. And he saw that I was again, just as dedicated, just as passionate as he was, and <laughs> before you know it, I, um, I, I started to attend more of these readings. There was this person who we both know, and who some of you may also know her name is Anne Fogelman. Some, yeah, some people call her the poetry wrangler. She, w I would see her go out into the fields, into the savannas of Barnes & Noble, and just grab people, and just recruit them, and just say, come on, you know, you know you want to attend, let's Let's go. And she she said to me, if you want people to, to read your work, 
which is virtually impossible because my penmanship is being hieroglyphics. Um, uh, this graph, yeah. <laughs> but um, they have to hear you first. And I took that to heart. And I started performing a lot more, um, whether it was my work or someone else's. Quite a few years ago, there was this poet that we both know. He's originally from Chicago, as I am, but he currently lives in Houston. His name is Brian Kahinda, and he he has this certain you know, tradition that when he enters the stage, he'll read a piece by someone else, whether living or deceased. And I thought that was a brilliant idea because if it wasn't for the uh, the elders or or for our contemporaries, we wouldn't be doing this. So I started to adopt that, um, and. Uh, yeah, before, before I knew it, Dustin made me assistant editor. Harbinger Asylum was a, it was a grand day, indeed. And then, <laughs> a year later, we officially became Transcendent Zero Press. Did you tell them the origin of the, the name? I didn't tell them. It's kind of funny, because when I was about 15, um, I, uh, I was in, big into punk rock, and, and I wanted to be in a punk band. And uh, I had a habit of reading the dictionary. And I found this word transcendent. And I liked the word. I liked what it meant. And at the time, that was a big hit. I think it was 1995. There was a hit by Smashing Pumpkins called Zero. And at the time, I just was like, slammed them together and like, hey, that sounds cool. And I drew the logo. I st and we used this logo. I drew the little logo and everything. And um, and it was basically my... my um, that's anybody, but... Yeah, it's basically my, uh, my word for a kind of uh, divine consciousness is what I've developed it into. Like, transcending zero... Like there's nothing you begin with nothing and then you end in the, in the end you transcend it or empty or in nothing or emptiness or whatever you want to call it. So that was yeah. the origins of the of the um, idea. Yeah. So we became an official business in 2012, tax documents and all. And um, <laughs> my favorite pastime. Yeah, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, we we've had. Uh, one heck of a time with this press. Uh, one of my favorites, absolute favorite parts is recruiting people who want to submit, uh, especially who live outside the U.S. Um, there's this, she, well, she was 19 at the time, she's this Greek um, law student who provided not only the English translation, but also the original Greek text to her work. And it's just, um, I, honestly, I'm more drawn to, whether it's music, visual arts, writing, uh, I'm more drawn to outside the U.S. or just in an English-speaking country in general. I just, I don't know, they're uh, I just uh, get a uh, different set of vibrations altogether. It's absolutely amazing. And um, I started out contributing some of my work as well. Uh, and then Dustin and quite a few other people encouraged me to submit elsewhere. And uh, I have a few books published myself. In fact, um, I think it's yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, this is. Don't forget to mention Studi too. Studi. Oh yeah. Uh, Got to bring her in. We recently. Uh, yeah. So sh I found her recently. This is my most recent book, and this is published by Weasel Press, which I will get to in a minute. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh. Her, so this, this, uh, this young academic from, uh, from India. We. Uh, I found her at first, and she was, she was extremely dedicated to her work, and then. Uh, just wanted to add her on to the TZ Press team, so she is also another assistant editor. Um, and uh, one of my favorite parts is the selection process, which I've been heavily involved in over the past few years. At first, it was mainly editing, proofing, and then, and I still do. I have eyes like a hawk, and I'm sure, as many of you know, the only person whose work you'll truly have trouble editing is your own. <laughs> That's why uh, I've started taking it upon myself whenever I type the final draft of, let's say, an essay I'm working on. Uh, I'm typing the final draft of an essay slash mini memoir that I finished recently. I, I've started to practice this um, strategy. I'm After I type in a paragraph, I edit. I go back and edit that instead of proofing, proofing it all. Because after a while, especially if it's online or through a screen, your attention span doesn't work as well as much as if it's a physical copy. Not speaking for everyone, of course, everybody has their own strategy. But, um, yeah, so uh, so as far as uh, what I look for in the in the journal, um, I, I look at quality, content, theme, style. Specifically, what I'm attracted to the most is symbolism by far. There are so many 
poets nowadays, um, for example, uh, people who write through button poetry and through Instagram. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm not knocking it. <laughs> it's just, it's just preference. Um, I'm crazy about symbolism, the abstract, the metaphorical, the just out there altogether. If it's weird, I absolutely love it. Um, as well as if it sends a message. And I, I believe as long as you understand your own work, um, that's, that's all that counts. And uh, because, of course, as you know, the arts are subjective unless the creator wants you to know what the meaning is from the very beginning. Um, for example, the book I'm passing around, Cosmish and the Horned Ones, it's what I like to call a, a non-linear narrative because um, there was another book that I published a few years ago called Wolf. It's an epic poem. I'm absolutely crazy about epic poetry. In a way, it's kind of like it's a mini epic, I suppose you could say, but the storyline itself, it's not like you can tell there's an idea in there. And instead of giving an introduction, there's a character page at the very beginning because uh, unlike my other volumes of work, I just want to throw people to the lions and just see what they come up with. Um, not to say that I tell others what my what my work is about. If, in fact, unless I want you to know, I can't. I can't stand doing that. If if you read a piece, um, that's your job. Because you, as the reader or the listener or the viewer, you hold more power than the creator themselves do. And I just I just hold the pen. I just, uh, I also love to sing as well. I, I I'm just the person who has the voice. You're the one who gets to decide what it means. And uh, and that's the power. Uh, and a sometimes unfortunate power of words because sometimes um, the masses will take it in a completely different direction and, and sometimes the artist is shocked. Uh, I never meant to say that. What are you people talking about? <laughs> um, the simple fact is um, if, you, if, if your mindset works in the way of um, I want to find this terrible theme, uh, I, I bet you anything they're going to, they're going to be speaking about it or, You'll find it because that's that's what your mind wants you to do. It's uh, the mind is a very powerful thing. Um, but yeah, we've uh, we published many many different issues of Harbinger Asylum as well as different themed issues as well. Uh, done anthologies. One of my favorites is. Um, do you want to tell them about the first two anthologies that we did? Yeah, he na he actually named the first one. It was called From One Spirit to Another, and we did a it's sort a of a tribute to the death of. Neil right, and we did like a greatest hits kind of thing over the you know the first two years of Harbinger Asylum, and then the, we did another one two years uh, later for those two years, and we stopped doing those because they got time consuming. But we still do you know occasional anthology. We did the Love Anthology, which I have a copy of. We did a self foot Anthology, which I edited with a um, a uh, uh, writer in uh, India who um, uh, is actually a best selling poet and author there. Um, so he, he helped out with that, and it has poets from all over the world. Um, we did a general call for submissions on the theme of selfhood and what selfhood means. And our love anthology, I actually went full out and nominated it for the Pulitzer Prize, uh, waiting to see what happens there. I don't expect to win or get anything for it, but we'll see. No matter what, love will reign supreme. So. Right. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so... While I was out there, I wanted to just get a couple of props, one of them I'm about to show you. And while I'm getting it out, how many of you have experienced writer's block in your life, or just block in, in creation in general? So, um, Dustin and I had the honor of seeing this, uh, this fantastic poet, Nikki Giovanni, at uh, well, the last year we attended AIPF. And I, I kind of had this idea in mind, but she sort of confirmed and enhanced that belief that there really is no such thing as writer's block. The only thing that's blocking you is yourself. There's also no such uh, there's also such a thing as not enough education. And she doesn't just mean academic, uh, just at a university. Of course, she means like just self-teaching. Uh, try to learn something new every day. Um, this baby has been helping me for goodness knows how long. People will think their memory will serve them well when it comes to um, jotting an idea down, but you may lose a great beauty, or what could have been a great beauty. This is a voice recorder, and um, and it's it's been serving me well for like almost 10, 11 years now, whether I want to 
jot down the name of a piece, whether it's an essay, a song, a poem, or maybe the entire piece, stream of consciousness, what it's going to be about. Um, just for the heck of it, I decided to calculate how many I had in all, just calculating poems, songs, and essays. I have almost uh, 1,600 <laughs> saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the thing is, though, I'm not I'm not afraid to lose all of that because there's always something to to be said. There's always something to write about, something to sing about, something to uh, create visual art about. And um, yeah, this has been helpful. It's just been a great um, a great accessory to uh, my path of creation. And um, it, it's uh, it's served me quite well. And uh, Giovanni's words really, really speak the truth. Do not let yourself block yourself. It's so easy to sometimes lose momentum. And, <laughs> uh, like, sort of like when you, if, if you love to work out and you become sick, it's, it's, like, it's very easy to, uh, to just stop, but you cannot let your sleep, you cannot let anything stop you. It's easier said than done. I totally, I'm not, I'm not taking anyone's situation for granted, but, um, also when it comes to creation, like fitness, you will you will you will feel a great sense of exhilaration or somewhat of a cleansing. For some people, it's a it's a cleansing. For me, writing confessional poetry is the equivalent of having a confessional booth and just expelling said thoughts. And um, which is what my fourth book is. It's uh, I don't have it with me, but it's called Cuentos de Amor, and it's it's a book length confessional piece. And it really it really was a cleansing. That there are just sometimes there are so many thoughts swimming up here, it's it's insane. And so sometimes the voice recorder won't do, and I can't really I can't really keep up with it. So um, I I typed this a couple Friday nights ago. It's the idea for a new um, it's for a new epic uh, poem and uh, I'm in the informal verse, and I'm going to be turning it into a rock opera as well. Um, so. If you want to just pass it around. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's just without the arts, not to sound over dramatic, but I wouldn't be on this planet right now. Um, that and also because of David Bowie's music and in, in high school. But that's another story for <laughs> time. <laughs> or, as, or as Nietzsche wrote, uh, without music, without music life would be a life would life be, would a, be mistake. a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you can apply that to all the arts in general. Definitely. Yeah. But I, definitely say that about the arts. Um, yeah, so it's just, so never let your ideas go, even if you, th again, even if you think your memory will serve, even if it's just for a minute, because to me, regret is sort of a hellhound that sinks its teeth into your flesh and will not let go whatsoever. Um, and does anyone else have this problem when they go to sleep at night and they're laying down, they turn the lights <laughs> off, everything's done and the day's yeah. over with and you're ready to go to sleep and your brain says, oh wait, I've got a great idea for a story. <laughs> I hate when that happens. I, one of the things I started doing is keeping a notebook like on a bed, like a bed stand, you know, and maybe having a little light, like a night light or something that way. If I am like, oh, oh wait, I've got an idea. Okay, just jot it down real quick and then. I'm looking up in the middle of the night. Yeah, things dreams and everything, right you know, just, yeah, it, it, it yeah. happens. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy, and sometimes, especially when you're starting to sleep, <laughs> sometimes what your brain does is, hey, let's think about this, and let's think about this, and this Party whole time. menagerie of chaos, you know, and it's right. just, it's, oh it's, it's, oh, it's wonderful. It's, but it, keep, it keeps life interesting, I gotta say, except you have a, if, if you have, like, a meeting in the morning, but... I've heard a lot of writers say the exact same thing. When they're going to sleep, that's when all the... I guess when your brain's relaxing, your subconscious starts acting, and it's starting to tell you stuff, spit stuff at you, you know, that you've been thinking about during the day. It's, it's interesting how that happens. Oh, when happens. you're first waking up. And that, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're, tra you're attempting to prepare yourself for uh, the day's triumphs and trepidations, and when all of a sudden this jumps out at you, and you're like... To heck with obligations. <laughs> this is gold. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, but like especially with submissions and what Dustin was to, to elaborate, what Dustin was talking about as far as this reverse psychology, I I've sort of invented this uh, reverse psychology method for myself in almost any field. Uh, it, it just when it comes to rejection in general, it's going to sound a tad pessimistic, but I assure you, people, it's not. Um, I expect rejection. It's not a self-fulfilled prophecy. It's just whether it's a job application or uh, or in the field of submitting my work or 
music or dare I say amor, um, it's just expect rejection because when it happens, it's not going to sting as terribly. You can, yeah. you don't you don't have to dwell on it for goodness knows how long. You can move forward. You have your you've had your little beast thing. You've had your little moments. It's cleared. Move forward. And if there's an acceptance somewhere, it's that much more of a celebration yeah. because you were not you were not expecting that. So I've sort of wired my brain for that. And so every single time I've been accepted in a journal or a magazine or if I've I've had an entire book published. Um, I'm jumping. I'm usually the only one jumping around, and it's great because outside my window, it's it's just bricks, and nobody can see me dancing like a fool. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, no, it's so I. I sh um, it's like going to see a movie. If you've heard great reviews, you have high expectations. Potentially, there's going to be disappointment. Right. Right. But if you haven't heard any reviews, or mm -hmm. if you've heard bad stuff, but you want to see it anyway. You can be very pleasantly surprised. Definitely, definitely. Agreed, agreed. I, um, especially with films, like, I honestly, I haven't listened to the critics in about 10 or 11 years because probably one of the worst films of 2008 turned out to be my favorite film. Which one was that? It was called uh, Cloverfield. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, but that did eventually get good reviews. It did, yeah, eventually. I actually had to take my friend home because. Uh, he didn't really pay attention to the warnings of shaky camp sickness, so uh, that was fun. But uh, but no, other than that, no, it was uh, yeah. So it's but the thing is, I, I can't really talk because number one, I don't really see a lot of films as much, uh, or I don't watch a lot uh, on the tube, and, um, and secondly, like the way that music, visual art, and literature, um, thank you, impacts my life. Um, films don't as much anymore, except if they're, I'm crazy about black and white films, uh, especially horror. Poet life films? Mm -hmm. Poet, the poem, you know, films about poets' lives or artists' lives. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, those as well, for sure. I, yeah. I showed I showed Dustin a couple. Um, there was this really interesting film that came out years ago. Uh, it was about Allen Ginsberg. And James Franco played him. It was, called, it was just mm -hmm. called Howl. And mm -hmm. it was really great how they, they shot four different... Uh, not exactly scenes, but I guess segue. It just segued uh, into one after the other, and it kept going back in this full. Well, since they're four, I'm not going to say full circle. But um, yeah, there was the trial. Um, as far as uh, the obscenity trial, when Howell came out, there was an animated version of the poem as he was reading aloud. There was the famous six gallery reading when he was reading it aloud for one of the very first times, and there was an interview between him and this faceless interviewer. Um, but anyway, um, I, of course. Yes. I apologize, everybody, because I have to leave at seven. I do have a couple of questions that I would like to ask. If that's all right. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Of course. So first of all, I really like your titles, Dustin. Thank you. They're very interesting. Um, do you two support yourselves with your writing and your publishing? I fin don't. Finan financially? financially? No, no, no. no. Um, it takes care of itself, but we don't. We don't make, actually really make yeah, it. Yeah, I, so I. You have to work as well. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so for me, I, um, I, I kind of call myself a corporate hippie because <laughs> <laughs> what it is, I, um, so I work in an in an office setting, uh, but underneath that is an artist bursting with creativity. And and to be, I, I was thinking about this. To be quite honest, for me personally, I wouldn't have it any other way. If I was, if I relied on writing to be my income, I probably wouldn't enjoy it as much. The, the, the passion would probably just fade away because now it's just a, a, a means to an income. Mm -hmm. um, For me, you know, when I publish a book, a lot of times, since it doesn't really make a lot of money in general because of the way the system's set up, like if you're selling through Amazon, they take a cut, the yeah, printer takes a cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you may... You make if more you, selling by hand. Okay. If you, yeah, yeah. If you, if, you know, but if you sell a book for let's say ten dollars per sale online, you might get two dollars. And so I let the publisher, you know, whoever publishes that, they take it because they're investing in it. Yeah. So all my books, I've never made a single penny off of, um, um, except by hand sales. You know, right. I'll buy a few handful of copies and I'll sell them by hand. A lot of times I just give them away because I don't want to read them. You know, but if I have extras. I just, there you go. And if, if there are other authors, I always, I always try and trade. Trade, yeah, that's a very yeah, popular thing. There's actually a phrase, the gift economy, um, which applies to the arts, where it's, there's no real, I guess you could say, incentive-driven uh, market. It's more like, you know, you're looking for um, reputation or you're looking for people to read your work or to pay attention to you. So it's more like a, a cultural capital instead of actual 
like financial capital. You're not really going to make a whole lot of money. It's more about you know people paying attention to what you're doing and, and appreciating what you are and it's sort of like theology. meeting new people. It's, in a way, it's sort of like theology. It's more of a calling than anything. I yeah. Mean, if if you're if so. you're hoping for big financial bucks. Uh, I mean, very that, few. I very, think. very few. I'm not saying it's 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 not impossible. You you never know. You never know. I mean, uh, John John Ashbery won practically every uh, poetry and literature <laughs> award. That, he's the only one that ever sustained his life with, with poetry true. award money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, him and Ginsburg kind of. Ginsburg also taught. He uh, yes. he was a he was a professor right. and um, and he helped founded the uh, Jack Kerouac uh, school and. Uh, Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. So, of course, go right ahead. Yes. Do you remember your poems by heart? In other words, poems that you've written over time, can you still remember them? Well, you you mean, them? Oh, like, like recite them from top to bottom? Yeah. Um, depends. I, I think very few. I have a few that I've memorized, and I've memorized poems by other writers, but a lot of times over time you get rusty. Yeah, my, I memorized everything from Sylvia Plath to Shakespeare, a couple of my own. I have one called Greenest Dream that I, it's probably one of my favorites by myself, that I've, that I've read it so many times that I can pretty much Remember. spit it out, like, for the most part. Yeah, in a, in a way, in a way, if, I, I'd say if you recite your own work by heart, it's kind of like jazz, because in a way, if you forget and you keep a straight face, nobody's going to notice that. A little improv in there. Yeah. Yeah. Just keeping key. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fake it. Up, 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 up. <laughs> well, my last question is, um, what have you found more effective in terms of thinking and writing at the same writing and thinking, thinking, expressing, handwriting or typing? Uh, I'll let you take this one first, then I'll... I do both. Um, with poems, what I do is I do have a... When I go through a phase where I feel like I'm very active poetically... I'll try to write three poems a day, handwriting. Um, I've actually written in like 30 poems in a couple of days on typewriting. Uh, not typewriting on a typewriter, but you know, uh, on a keyboard. On keyboard right. If I'm writing a story or something like that, I generally like to do it on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, and like I was saying earlier about the, the, the you know, the gears, you know, the mm -hmm. plus and minus, you know, it's like it's a very uh, blind process almost. You kind of get a general idea of what you're going to do, and then you just kind of watch what you're doing and say, okay, wait, does this really make sense? Is this something that's believable? Um, so you have that thing called the suspension of disbelief, and, you know, it's, uh, sometimes ideas just spontaneously throw themselves out as I'm in the middle of something, and I'm just like, okay, let's take it this direction and see what happens. For me, on the other hand, I, I've sort of developed, um, I wouldn't really call it a routine, because routine, it's like just saying it. It just sounds so bland. It sounds so obligated. I've come up with a pleasurable process. Um, I must handwrite first. I, I admire those writers who will sit at the computer and type out the first draft, but more often than not, I hear them just staring at it for the longest time, and I just can't. I cannot imagine doing so. So for me, handwriting, if anything, it's a it's a it's a very pleasurable. Blah, you can tell about process. the receipt poems and stuff like that.